How many are ready for the word today? Sean Foyt was a friend of the house. He's now family in the house. He's here with his entire family. I swear, Sean will do more in a year than most people will do in their entire lifetime. He's like, yeah, I'm putting out a movie, an album, and a book. And that's just in September. I mean, it's, just, it's wild what, what this guy has the ability to do. He is passionate about all things Jesus, all things kingdom, the presence of God. He is a gift to my life personally, to our community, to mercy culture church and to the nation honor is one of our values could you please stand to your feet put your hands together and welcome our friend Sean Foyt thank you guys thank you have a seat I uh there's a lot to celebrate today Celebration and joy is going to be a big theme, but I want to share with you a quick video. Um, you guys have been such a huge part of the Let Us Worship journey and have been behind us, and we're celebrating um, over two years now of seeing revival sweep across America. And uh, if you could play that video, that's what I want to start with today. And the billion soul harvest has started. But this is not a protest, even though in a sense it is. This is a gathering to, I believe, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, you've ordained praise to silence the foe of the Avenger.
video gets me. Two years chasing after Jesus. It's so special to be here um, this weekend. I think for us, it's a real gift. Um, we claim this is one of our home churches, just so you're, if you're wondering. It's our Texas home church. And um, we had a movie that came out on Friday. Get this, the first time ever a film was released about the 2020 pandemic and released into major theaters across America. And guess what? It's a film that shares God's story. <laughs> 600 theaters across America on Thursday night, super spreader, the film was released, over 600 theaters. And we immediately, on night number one, went to the top five movies in America. My phone was getting blown up all night. Theaters were hijacked with prayer, with worship, people, body, body piles of people getting impartation, salvation altar calls happening all over America. The same theaters that discipled a generation in violence, in sex, in corruption, in darkness, in horror, now are filled with the sound of revival. Come on! This is amazing! All over America! All over America! People encountering Jesus in the theaters! <laughs> Why don't you run that uh, really quick trailer in case those of you that haven't seen it, here are the, well, run the trailer, then I'll show that slide. This is America's super spreader. The principle of religious freedom is being severely tested by the pandemic. Singing has been banned at all church services in California. We need to bend the curve. I can feel something inside of me like we've got to take a stand. Christian singer and activist Sean Foyt leading what's called Let Us Worship. This guy is probably responsible for hundreds of deaths. We thank you, Lord, that there is another story that the media is telling. It is one of hope. There's a pandemic. There's a plague. Here's a move of God. This gonna change America. The whole thing is fear, man. It's fear, it's intimidation. Courage is taught when you see it. You can't teach it as principles. You have to see it modeled. Christians are rising up, I'm telling you guys. Light overcomes darkness every day. This is not political, this is biblical. Super Spreader, rated PG-13, in theaters September 29th. Come on. <laughs> Throw up the uh, graphics. So Fort Worth, so here's what's really cool. We had 600 theaters on the 29th on Thursday, and then several other theaters were like, you know what, we don't wanna just do one night. I mean, this is historic. They're like, we don't wanna just do one night. We'll do a full week long run of this film. We didn't even pay for that. Like it was just voluntarily like Regal, Regal Theaters and several other ones decided to do that. So it is showing at these three theaters in Fort Worth until Thursday this week. You gotta go see it. Turn to someone and say, you ready to go to the movies? Bring your friends, bring people that would never go to church. I'm telling you, there is an anointing on this film to bring salvation and healing. One of the most amazing things about it is, is that even on this film, we interviewed all of my trolls. We let them share their side of the story. If people are cynical or maybe they've been against the church in this season, they're gonna have their voice heard. But at the same time, it's undeniable the power of God before your eyes as you watch it. So anyway, go see it in, in, in theaters. Uh, make sure, make sure to go see it and get your tickets early because a lot of them are filling up. And uh, man, we're just so, so excited. Me and my wife are so grateful to be here to celebrate what a historic weekend. I never wanted to do a film. And by the way, I would, don't go into these things lightly. This has been one of the biggest undertakings we've ever had. It's, it's a, a lot of work. However, I was telling Pastor Landon in the back how it's amazing the multiplication that can happen. Like we're, we can do one event in one city and we, we've done 170 of them. But in one night, we can have encounter 
places of 600 people encountering God. I mean, I feel like it's time for the stories of revival to be told across America. And I think this is even prophetic that we're showing it here. I think there's a grace on you guys to start telling God's story. Amen. All right. Well, I want to talk about today. It's a giveaway with my shirt in the film. Super spreaders of joy. This is who we are. And I'm just going to warn you at the end of this service, we're about to get crazy. I don't care. This is early service. I don't give a rip. Like it is about to get so wild in this place. We're going to do something that I don't know has ever been done in here. But I want to talk about this. We're in such a crazy, divisive, polarized season. And our greatest weapon is joy. You can see in that two year anniversary video, that's why I wanted to show you that. What you don't see in that is the resistance we encountered. You don't see in that the, the fines that we incurred. You don't see in that Antifa attacking us and Satanists and crazy mayors and governors and all that kind of stuff. All you see is glory, but we faced so much resistance. And God told me in the beginning that we were gonna face the resistance and we were gonna overcome with joy. And if there's anything I could inject into your heart, and I'm pretty tired coming off of this movie and a wild year and everything else. But I wanna tell you one thing. We were in Manhattan a week ago today, Times Square. And we're like, yeah, let's, let's do a, you know, let us worship. We've done, done them across New York. Let's go for Times Square. We got a permit, it was a miracle. And I thought, you know what, we're gonna set up on Times Square. We maybe have a couple hundred wild, rowdy New Yorkers that are gonna rumble with us. We show up, 5,000 people are there. Show up the picture. Look at this. It's one week ago. There were so many people in Times Square, the police had to block the streets off. And this was what's so wild about it. This was the happiest, most joyful group of New Yorkers I've ever met. <laughs> New Yorkers hate Times Square and, and they, they can be a little irritated at some times, but it was like the virus of joy infected us. We went for like three hours, no one wanted to stop. We had protesters and it's, it's funny because, you know, the protesters show up and now it's like, um, I, I just watch it. I step back and I'm like, oh, this is going to be good. They showed up with the F the church signs and the, the really famous abortion uh, uh, girl showed up with, with baby dolls, heads ripped off. And, and she was crazy and half dressed and not even half quarter dressed. And the moment she showed up, I'm like, oh, this is gonna be good. She showed up and started doing all this and all, immediately 50 intercessors. <laughs> immediately the guy, with the, the guy with the F the church sign, a hundred intercessors pile around him. God, deliver him, fill him with your presence. <laughs> they lasted about three minutes. And it was like so fun to see this contagious joy overtake this place in New York City, the epicenter of distraction and culture. And here we were having a God encounter. People just getting wrecked in the presence of God. I'm telling you guys, this is a season, if it can happen in Times Square, New York, it can happen anywhere. I want you to turn to the book of Hebrews. I'm gonna share a couple of verses with you and then we're gonna have a time of impartation. Hebrews chapter 12. This, this is what I call the unseen reality. And I'm really preaching to you as we approach these midterm elections and everything else, it's gonna get gnarly, it's gonna get wild, the enemy's gonna try to get us to be angry, grumpy Christians. And I just, I'm telling you, today at Mercy Culture in Fort Worth, we're making a war on grumpy Christianity. None of y'all are gonna leave here today grumpy. We don't got time for that. There's too much good stuff God's doing. Hebrews, verse 12, it talks about the mountain of fear and the mountain of joy. 
I'm just gonna read it, read through it quickly. It says, you have not come, verse 18, to a mountain that can be touched, that is burning with fire to darkness, gloom and a storm, to a trumpet blast or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded. Even if an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I'm trembling with fear. It says, you have not come. It's basically reminding you of the Old Testament era. It's a new day. You've not come to the Old Testament, which is fear, a fear-based response. It says in verse 22, but you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Understand the unseen reality of what you're living in. You, it, it, it's like we, we went into Philadelphia the night before New York and the last, the last broadcast from Philly was that really gnarly, dark presidential speech. In Independence Mall, calling half of American semi-fascists, it was just dark and red and weird. And I don't know who's responsible for the PR for that, but they really messed up. However, here we were two weeks later and we're not bringing a message of fear and division. We're bringing one of joy and hope. We were in downtown Philly, man, and it was like a party went off right there in Independence Mall where they signed the Declaration of Independence, where they drafted the U.S. Constitution, where the Liberty Bell hangs. We were ringing the bell again saying, it's a new day of freedom in America. And as we were worshiping in one of the highest crime cities in America that people don't have hope for, guess what was happening in the atmosphere? Angels upon angels in joyful assembly. The spiritual realm was exploding with joyous activity. I love how it says that the thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, making sure you understand that that they're gathering and they're singing and they're swirling around with joy. Imagine if we lived in that reality. It's like, I feel like so many times we're like, we're, <laughs> we're, and, and it's, it's easy in the world that we live in. It's like, it's like things are getting crazy and it's hard for us to remember, hey, listen, right now, the angels in heaven are saying that place is full of his glory. That place, that city of brokenness, that place of pain. Right now, in heaven, they're declaring this place is full of his glory. There's an unseen reality that we must tap into, that we must understand. Isaiah chapter nine, the mandate of Jesus. I'm giving you some ammo for your joy bomb. Isaiah chapter nine, I love this. This is the first declaration in the book of Isaiah about the coming of Jesus. And look at how he describes it. Verse two, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. Come on somebody, joy. They rejoice before you. As people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. That's four times joy has been mentioned in the first three verses of the coming of Jesus. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you will have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, every warrior's boot used in battle and garment and blood. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulders. He will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. So he says, yeah, he's coming to take over the world. Deal with it. But you know how you're gonna know it's him? You know how you're gonna recognize that it's really him? Joy, 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 joy. In case you're wondering, 
When he comes, he will be known for four times joy. This is the first mentioned pro pro prophecy of the coming of Jesus. And Isaiah is saying, you will know him because you'll feel the joy. Yes, he's going to crush armies and he's going to rule over the earth and he's going to destroy darkness and he's going to do all those things. But you'll know that it's him because of the joy that he brings. The posture of the king, Psalms chapter 2. We're doing Bible quiz today. Psalm chapter 2. You guys sang about that this morning. Why do the nations conspire and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointing, saying, let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. The one enthroned in heaven is deeply concerned and worried. The one enthroned in heaven is very intimidated. <laughs> Now, the one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. I'm not going to get into theology behind this, but I think sometimes it's godly to go, you know, you can't sing in church. Well, dude, you're not Pharaoh. Give me a break. <laughs> like, the Lord mocks them. Like, are you kidding me? Like, they're banding together. They're so hardcore. They can't wait. And the Lord's like, give me a break. Are you serious? I wish we had that attitude more. Maybe we'd be a little less stressed. Maybe we'd be a little, a little less addicted to prescription meds. Maybe we'd be a little, little less attached to Wall Street and our 401k and how the market's doing. As if like God is, only, is, is waiting for public opinion to change so he can return. <laughs> it's not up for debate. And I think sometimes one of the most powerful things for us to do is coming in the opposite spirit when we feel fear and intimidation and all this stuff is to just, you know what, have a laugh party. Get together and laugh. Well, you're not recognizing how serious it is. Actually, no, I'm recognizing how serious it is because he's on the throne, he's in control. Sometimes one of the most powerful things we could do is tune out to the noise down here and tune unto to the noise up here. This is why you are worshiping church. This is why worship is so powerful. It's not just the, the precursor to the message, Texas people. It's your lifeline. This is why you jam it in your car when you're stuck in all your traffic around here. I lived here. I would not have survived if it wasn't for worship. I remember one time, this is a true story, I was on, I was, I was, we were living in Richardson, Texas, and I was, I was stuck on 75, and, and um, where 75 and 635 come together, and it was just gnarly, and I was late to a meeting, and I was sitting there, and the Lord started speaking to me, hey, um, you know, this whole thing that you tell people about, like, worshiping, like, like, you're stuck here, why don't you just worship? Like, yeah, Lord, I'm not really in the mood, I'm late, and... And no, I think you need, to, you need to worship, like worship, worship. And so I, I, I really felt the Holy Spirit. And so I was like, ah, trying to get out of my mind all, the thing I was late for, how I was frustrated, how I was hated this city and all the traffic and all the construction and all the stuff and all these stupid drivers that whatever. And so I turned on worship and I was sitting there and I was just like, okay, I'm, I'm trying to get in the zone, I'm trying to like get out of the flesh, get in the glory. And I'm sitting there and the Lord said, no, 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 really worship. And I'm like, I am really worshiping. I have my hands down here, my eyes closed. No, no, worship like you do, like at, in the front row, like go, go after me. And so finally I was just like, you know what, forget this. And I just was like, ah. 
I was just going for it in my truck, sitting there like this. And all of a sudden, I'm like 10 minutes like lost in this swirl. And I hear, hong, hong. everybody's like looking at me in the cars around me. And I just thought, you know what? What if, what if we actually, what if Christians were known as those obnoxious worshiping people? Like, I love it this weekend that in theaters across America, you can't get these people out of the movie. Good luck. Better just keep playing the film. I mean, they're taking over lobbies. There was one theater I saw last night in Tennessee. They literally, these, <laughs> these people made a fire tunnel in the lobby. So everybody that was coming out of any movie shown was getting prayer. I mean, it's time for, and you know what? People actually loved it. People were loving prayer. People were loving that there was happy Christians in the theater. Like, I feel like it's time for us. There's a joy that God wants to inject in our heart that we're gonna need, especially coming in to the beginning of November. He who sits in the heavens laughs. Verse, uh, point number four, Ephesians Five, turn there. Ephesians chapter five, I love this. This is a New Testament take on the virus of joy. Verse 15, it says this. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity. Well, that seems very practical. Be careful how you live. You wanna be wise. You wanna make the most of every opportunity. That's, that's, that's great advice. How do we do that? Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Oh, I want to understand what the Lord's will is. How do we do that? Verse 18, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery, but instead be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, I'll say this. There's a common correlation in the New Testament to drunk people in the natural, to drunk people in the spirit. The first statement ever said about the early church, listen to this, the first statement ever said about the early church in all of human history is they look drunk. You guys remember that? First thing ever said, not, oh, they're so cool. Ooh, they're so relevant. They just, they're just like, wow. Or they're so smart or they're intelligent, or they have it all together. No, the first statement was, these people are crazy and drunk. How few times is that said about the church today? That was the thing they were known for. And so he's saying, do not get drunk on wine, but in the same way or in the same fashion or like a drunk person would be, be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs, spiritual songs from the Spirit, sing and make music to the Lord from your heart, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know what I think is interesting? This is a season where there is a grace and an authority and God is opening the doors for the public display of the gospel all across the world. I mean, if you would have told me that we would have had 5,000 people in Times Square and had a three hour worship service in my lifetime, I don't know if I would have believed you. If you would have told me that we would have 600 theaters packed with people worshiping and praying in cities across America, I don't know if I would have believed you. There is a hunger across the world for the true display of what the gospel means. It was funny, actually, when we, when we, when we showed up at Times Square um, in, in 2020, we came to New York and and I really, we were on the West Coast and I really felt like, God, if you can do it in these cities, like I would love to see it in New York. I love that city. There's amazing people there. So we showed up in Washington Square Park with the arch, the famous arch that's in all the movies. And uh, this was at the height of the rioting and the looting and it was just crazy. And then COVID and, and anyway, people weren't gathering needless to say. 
we showed up, there was a, a NYPD guy wearing white that who was over that area. And so I knew he was the guy we needed to talk to. And so I walked over there and actually walked over there with my girl from Jersey, my friend, and she, she just walked up to the office. She goes, uh, excuse me, officer, we about to have church up in here. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I know y'all been having protests and stuff, but we about to have church. It's about to be holy ground. <laughs> the officer looks at her and he goes, oh, yes, ma'am, okay. And so we told him, well, halfway through the service, people wanted to get baptized. And you'll see that in the film. That's one of the most powerful moments in the film. People want to get baptized. We didn't have a place to baptize them. This is in 2020. So I went over the, to the, that same chief of police guy and I said, hey, um, I was like, I know this is weird, man, but like we want to baptize people. And I think like, can we use the fountain? <laughs> and he looks at me and he goes, you want to baptize people in the fountain? I was like, yeah. <laughs> and he's like, y'all are crazy. And he's like, all right, you can do one at a time, you know. So we, we had a line of bapti baptizing people for hours in Washington Square Park. We show up in Times Square. There's tens of thousands of NYT, NYPD policemen. The guy in charge of our event, of our area in Times Square, was that same guy. I walked up to him. I walked up to him and I go, and he looks at me and he goes, not you. <laughs> he goes, how did this happen? I said, it's God, man. He said, what are y'all going to do here? I said, we're going to worship. It's going to get wild. He's like, all right, I'm going to warn everybody. I'm going to warn all my officers. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? And God just continues to write his story. But I love this, how, how the, the in, inherently our charge as believers is to carry this almost obnoxious, outlandish, like a drunk person would be, but in the spirit. Like you should be known. People should understand that there's something about you that doesn't blend in. You don't go according to the current narrative. And I love it, you know, I go on these shows, I was just on Tucker Carlson, number one cable news show in, 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 in history. And, you know, he, he wants to talk about the issues and, and, and the, the, the problems with churches shutting down and all that stuff, and I get that, right? I wanna talk about the remnant that's rising up. I'm like, that's one way you could talk about it, how the church was weak and blah, 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 blah. But I'll tell you this, Tucker, the true church of Jesus Christ is rising on the earth. And I love to go on these conservative channels where they, it's, it's really easy to get dark and it's really easy to get down. And I'm like, no, 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 no. We're carrying hope right now. We're carrying joy right now. We are overcomers in Jesus. I refuse to bow to this narrative that we're beat down and pushed into a corner. Let's all run to our bunkers and get our ARs and wait this thing out. That's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Ephesians 5 says that we're to be filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking to one another with songs, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. I love that. There's so many dimensions. I don't have time to break this down of the song of the Lord. There's a vertical dimension, which means that we're worshiping God like we were this morning. There's a horizontal, uh, uh, there's a horizontal dimension of that where we're prophesying to one another. And there's songs that God's going to call forth and he's done it in Jasmine and other people that are going to be prophetic songs to call people to attention. It's the vertical and it's the horizontal. We need both. We need to be the church that sings the heart of God over people. This is why we wrote this song, Imago Day. I don't know if you've heard it, but I was so bummed and I'm going to get into the story here. And then we're going to do impartation. Actually, while I get into this story, I want you to turn to 2 Samuel 6. This is where this whole thing started for me. So I'm in high school. I go to this event in 2000 on the National Mall. God drops this burden on my heart, like, like so strong, like it's nothing you could contrive to pray for the ending of Roe v. Wade. I got a life band, still have one on, it's faded. And I prayed every day 
God, end abortion, send revival to America. I've just prayed this consistently. We did life sieges. We did life marches. We prayed. We, 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 we advocated. We did all this stuff, and things just got worse. I mean, I don't know if, 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 if you remember, but things got so bad, especially in the 2010s. Like, it seemed like everything was going the opposite way. Like, we were losing the battle. And I remember at that time, I could hardly find anybody that believed that it was possible to overturn that in our lifetime. There was literally two people in the world. I'll never forget, I was driving with Bill Johnson. We were going to a Warriors game in San Francisco. And I looked over to him and I said, hey, I said, this is getting so bad. This is pre-2020. No, pre-2016. I said, do you think that this, this is ever going to overturn? And he looked at me and he's like, of course it is. Yeah, we have the promise. And I was like, okay. <laughs> Lou Angle, I don't think he ever doubted in his whole life, right? So I knew two people in the world that believed it would happen. So anyway, fast forward. God is so funny. I, I just love God and his sense of humor and his timing. It's like there's a million times he could have done this in the last few years. And he just decides, you know what? I'm just going to get wait. I'm going to wait till it gets really bad. I'm going to wait till our current administration takes over. I'm going to wait till like some of the worst legislators are pushing. I mean, I'm going to wait till the Senate, every single uh, uh, senator on the left votes for infanticide to kill a baby after it's born alive. I'm going to wait till that moment to sneak in the Dobbs decision. I mean, no one can take credit for this, you guys. And so I remember when the Dobbs decision came out, the Lord gave us this place in, 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 Capitol, in Capitol Hill and we began to pray 40 days. We would march around the Supreme Court and pray. Yeah, we were weird Christians. We were those ones. Every day we got the intercessors together and we would worship and we'd march around the Supreme Court. God, bind that decision together. Let them not succumb to the intimidation and the scare tactics and the assault of people seeking to destroy them. Let them stand strong on their initial decision because that whole Dobbs leak was on purpose to get them to change course. And so here we are, and then the decision comes down. And I remember thinking back in high school, if this ever gets overturned in my lifetime, the streets in America are going to explode with praise. Hundreds of thousands of Christians are going to be dancing in the streets. I remember thinking, if this ever happened, it happened. Silence. It happened. Well, now's not the time to rejoice. Now the real work begins. I'm like, are you crazy? We've been doing the real work for 50 years. We've been praying, we've been interceding, we've been adopting. There's five, five to 10 pregnancy centers for every, every Planned Parenthood. The church has always been at the forefront. Well, now's not the time to celebrate. And then even worse, you have a lot of pastors in a lot of churches arguing that it should never have been overturned. And I was like, I'll never forget, I was just so because I've been praying for this for so long. We were at the Supreme Court the day after. We do a worship service. There's 100 people there. It was awesome. We got crazy. We danced. We looked like crazy people. We rejoiced. We praised the Lord. And I was so embarrassed by the response of the church in America. I was about to go. I remember I was getting my phone out. I was like, I'm going to just blast these people. I'm out. I'm like, I was in the flesh. <laughs> I'm going to just annihilate these people. I'm going to call them out by name, you know. And the Lord spoke to me and said, don't do that. Don't do that. Put your phone down. That's a good word for some of y'all. Put your phone down. And, uh, and he said, remind a generation how valuable life is. And so we wrote the song, Imago Day and I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I had my kids sing on it. It went number one in Christian music. 
even though Caleb wouldn't play it and all these stations wouldn't play it because it was too political. But then the Lord started to speak to me even further about rejoicing and about how according to 1 Samuel 6, and I'm gonna summarize the story, but David, the ark is coming into the city. David's losing his mind. He strips down to his underwear. He's the king. He throws off his priestly garments and he says that statement that we sing so many times, I will be even more undignified than this. His wife, who's the daughter of Saul, is upset at him and angry at him as an, and, and is embarrassed. It says that she went to David and she said, how dare you do that in front of the people? You embarrass me, you embarrass yourself. And David turned to her and I'm summarizing it. You can read it in second, 1 Samuel 6. He goes, honey, that wasn't about you. And it says at the very end of that chapter that Michael, the daughter of Saul, was barren until the day of her death. And I believe that our lack of ability to rejoice in what God is doing will bring barrenness on our lives. And so this is what I want to do. That's a little bit heavy, but we're about to get fun. This morning, we're going to do a victory lap. Like in the church. A couple people are excited about it. No, no. No, we're actually going to do a victory lap. Like every single person is going to do a dance victory. Some of y'all can, you know, if you, you can shimmy or whatever you want. Around this church celebrating, number one, that the death decree of Roe v. Wade is overturned. <laughs> that the gospel of Jesus Christ is going forth. That the gates of hell will not stand against the church that 600 theaters are being filled with worship and praise. And I'm telling you, you guys, I feel like as we do this victory dance, and I don't know who's gonna lead it, probably Pastor Landon or someone crazy, we're gonna go around the sanctuary. And I'm telling you, this is a prophetic moment where I believe we're entering into the, the joy of the Lord. We're entering in to a season of celebration. Guys, this is such a great season for the church. This is such a great season for the church. And there's a joy that God wants to give you. And I just had this picture in my, and I, when I was praying about this. I had a picture that while you guys were dancing around this, place. I want everybody to do one lap. I don't know what that looks like, but or I don't know what that looks like for you guys up there, but maybe you could come down. We'll do it together. I had this picture though, as we were dancing around, I saw depression falling off people. I saw heartache. This is, this is one of the big ones. This is one of the big ones I saw in my spirit. I saw self-pity. I saw it crumbling to the ground. You don't know about my situation. You don't know about this. You don't know about this. And there's people in here that are wallowing in self-pity. And I want to tell you this morning, rise up. Rise up. There's a joy God wants to give you. There's a joy that's accessible, that's available. There's a joy that the angels are swirling around this room right now. And it's time to be known as the church, the church of Jesus Christ that carries the virus of joy. What made people so angry about this film and about what happened in 2020 is at a time of darkness. And Kate and I, we actually had people tell us this, where well, you can't just go across America in the middle of these race riots, in the middle of COVID, you can't just go, we had Christian leaders tell us, you can't just go across America and be joyful. I mean, these are like heady theological people. I'm like, what do you mean we can't just be joyful? Like that's our mandate. Like, especially in a season of darkness and heartache and fear. 
Like this is what the world's, you know what drew people to our gatherings? You know what drew 5,000 people there? Because there was 2,000 people initially and the other 3,000 people came because they just heard it was happy. They just showed up because it sounded fun. Hey, let's go to this fun thing. These people look excited. The world is looking for people of joy. They know what heartache looks like. They know what depression looks like. They know what pain looks like. They need to see a people that are filled with joy. All right, so how are we doing this? <laughs> what, what I love about Sean is many things, but he is the same person. I'm being honest. So Sean, about two years ago, came to our church for the first time. And with the hair, I wondered if he would be a diva. For real. I, I work like, hard on it. Worship leaders, that's their bent. You, you, know, what Danny, you know what I'm talking about. And Sh Sean was the most authentic, genuine, kind, humble, real person who you see on the stage is the exact person behind the scenes. And here's what I love. I'm going to be honest, okay? Is it doesn't matter if there's 5,000 in Times Square or a lame 50 in Austin when we're in Austin together. I went down to Austin, we went and did a Jesus March. No churches showed up. That's okay. We came from Fort Worth. We sowed. We got behind our friend, but watch, it inspired me because we danced on 6th Street. The 50 of us, like there was 5,000. Yeah. And when I watched Sean lead with 50 of us on the most wicked streets of Texas, I said, mercy culture needs this impartation of joy. Here's what we're gonna do. I want you, I want, if you're a pastor of mercy culture, I want you to come down to the front because the pastors are gonna lead this. <laughs> you guys could face the front, yeah. If you are an intercessor on the prayer team, come behind the pastors. If you are on in the staff, come behind them. Come face the stage. If you are an SLS student, come behind them. If you are a serve team member, come behind them. And here's what I'm asking for. The first time Sean came to Mercy Culture, he imparted an impartation of boldness into our community. And it forever changed the trajectory of our church. I'm asking him to come and impart that same fearless, reckless, never ending impartation of the spirit of joy into this house. So Malachi, start kicking the drum beat. Sean, I'm gonna ask you to pray over it. And when you're done praying, then I'm gonna release the pastors the, the intercessors, the staff, this SLS, the serve team, and every single person in the congregation. He said, everybody, he said, take one lap. So I don't know how long it will take, but if this is your church, if you're a visitor, it's like this every week. But if this is your church, I'm asking you as your pastor to get out of your seat and dance around this auditorium. You know, it's wild that Water is being troubled right now in the spirit. Mercy Culture Church, lift your hands all over this place. 
as you receive this impartation of joy. Sean, pray over this congregation. Yes, Lord, we thank you. 2 Corinthians 2.14 says, Thanks be to God who always leads us in a joyful procession. God, I thank you that you are leading your church into a joyful procession. I thank you that is our reality. Lord, that is our reality above the chaos, above all the confusion, above, above the politics, the politicalization of our society, above the polarization. God, I thank you that today we are seated in Christ, that he who sits in the heavens laughs. And I thank you, Jesus, that you're leading us on a joyful procession. And I thank you, Lord, on this joyful procession, we're gonna take cities back. We're gonna take schools back. We're gonna take neighborhoods back. God, I thank you, we're gonna take businesses back. I thank you, Jesus, that you are gonna invade, invade every area of our culture and society with the spirit of joy. So I just pray right now, God, fill them to the fullness with joy. Fill them to the fullness with contagious, outrageous, the virus of joy in Jesus' name. Go, 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 go. <laughs> Woo. <laughs> Woo. Come on, take a lap. Take a lap. I've got this joy. I've got this joy. 
for joy, 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 joy. Four times joy. So come on, put your hand on someone. We're going to pray this. We're going to shout joy four times according to Isaiah chapter 9. Well, what's your theological reason for this? I just told you, Isaiah chapter 9, <laughs> it says joy four times when it talks about the coming of Jesus. Before anything else, before he will destroy this or do this or judge that, it says, hey, you're going to know him because of joy, 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 joy. So we're going to shout joy four times. On the fourth time, we're going to go joy. Like you can go a little higher on the fourth time. I'll be out in the lobby signing books. I didn't get to talk about it, but I have a book. That's good. <laughs> All right, ready? On the count of three, we're going to go one, two, three. We're going to go joy, 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 joy. One, two, three. Joy, 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 joy. joy. One more time. One more time. On the count of three. One more time. One, two, three. Joy. Joy. 